she and I, I'm Dr. Marceau, uh, Janice Marceau, and um, Dr. McCoy and I were going to co-present anyways. I've seen her slides, but I haven't seen some of the recent updates, so I'll try to do my best to move through them. Um, if there's anything that I'm not sure how to interpret, I'll just make it up as I go, and if you don't notice, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'll be sure and be clear if I don't know something that she was intending on her slides. And it, feel free to let me know if you can't hear me or if you have any questions. And I'm just going to hide behind the podium here. So what I will be talking about today, um, well, let me take a step back. So the presentation is about cognitive screening instruments. It wasn't intended to be a talk really heavy in diversity, but diversity issues definitely come up whenever you are talking about identifying and screening patients for cognitive impairment. So there will be some elements of the presentation that include diversity. Um, but primarily, I will be looking at reviewing and rec making recommendations about cognitive screening instruments that are appropriate for both primary care and mental health care settings. And we'll go over a few terms before we get um, really into the depths of things. Talk about why it may be important to conduct brief cognitive assessments. Um, go over a few guidelines and diversity considerations. Um, talk about conditions that might be associated with cognitive complaints that you might want to look for whenever you're in the process of screening and referring to other providers. Um, and then I'll spend a majority of the time talking about a few different brief cognitive assessments that have been recommended by use within the VA and talk a little bit about the research on how sensitive and specific they are at picking up on cognitive um, disorders. And then I have a few case examples to go through with patients that I've seen in the VA here. Um, all right, so to move along, um, we've talked a lot about this today, so I'm not going to go into great detail defining these conditions, but we talked about dementia and mild cognitive impairment, and that NCI is kind of that intermediate stage before um, you experience the functional decline that would warrant a diagnosis of dementia. And then cognitive impairment or cognitive disorder is more of a broad term that encompasses any type of change or impairment in cognitive functioning. Um, a lot of times we talk about cognitive disorder NOS with our veteran populations because we can't really pin down exactly what the etiology is or maybe they're not to the stage where we're comfortable calling it a dementia. So that term also comes up in the literature as well. So I just want to acknowledge all three of these types of terms that may come up in some of our studies. From a VA standpoint, screening is a very different thing than what we think of in the clinical literature and from, from a research perspective. So the VA recently came out with some information where they're defining what they consider to be dementia screening. And it's a little different from how I learned about screening and how I conceptualize that. Um, but in this context, dementia screening means it's something that you're routinely and proactively administering to all people. So you're testing every single person that walks to the door to screen for something. Um, this is a little different from how it's presented in the literature where you may actually wait till you're working with an identified population and then doing what they, the VA considers to be a case finding. So it's targeted and it's brief and it's for a certain population, but it's still doing the same thing that we all think of as a screener. So I just want to kind of point this out because it may be something that down the road when the VA is putting out information about screening or case finding, you know where that terminology comes from. Um, so, which is why in my title I had screening in parentheses, because from the VA perspective, I'm really going to be talking about case finding or conducting brief cognitive assessments to pick up on cognitive impairment in a really targeted population. I'm not talking about screening every single patient that walks through the door from age 18 to 80. Uh, so, just to clarify, clarify that. Um, the VA rec media recommends um, for and or against screening for dementia in asymptomatic older adults. They definitely recommend screening for adults that have certain indications that make you think they do have some symptoms, particularly if they have cognitive complaints. So why should we be conducting brief cognitive assessments? That's what I tell my kid because I said so. But that's not really a justification enough, so I'm going to try to convince you with some other information. First, um, one thing that is really helpful is to look for change over time, and by conducting brief cognitive assessments, you can look for change within an individual. So we know that people, for a variety of different reasons, may score really high or really low on our cognitive measures. It's one snippet of time if we only see them once. We don't know if that's a change for that individual. But by doing more longitudinal assessments, you can look at them over time. 
Um, this is something that could easily be implemented if you're doing like a yearly primary care visit. So you may look for change over a much longer period of time, and that might give you something a little bit more specific to that individual. So that helps with, um, I didn't realize she had the fancy clicks on here, so I'm not sure what's coming up next. Um, but so this will help you track for changes over time, as I alluded to, which may aid in diagnostic clarification. You can track disease progression. You can track response to medications or interventions. Um, another purpose of conducting these assessments is to identify people who would benefit from referral at elsewhere. Um, so this may be to the neurologist, to a specialty clinic, to neuropsychology, which is the area in which I work. Um, and then what is the goal for a lot of people is to leave earlier diagnoses. And we'll talk about some of the benefits or um, consequences of that shortly, I believe. But what I think is our benefits of early diagnosis is because you leave for people to have a better quality of life, as we talked about earlier today. They may get access to treatment or care a lot sooner, which is going to hopefully lead them to stay you know, more functionally intact as well as, as much as they can be for much longer. Um, and then we want to help them to plan for the future while they're able to engage in that kind of planning. So they're all, all benefits, in my opinion. Also, for patients, if you can conceptualize or put a label on their, what they're complaining of as a memory problem, it can help them to get a better understanding and know what to do about it or where to go. Um, I know for patients who end up getting referred to our clinic, they really do like to hear specific recommendations that are tailored to their needs. They like to discuss what the diagnosis means and what the prognosis is. And so I think, not that they necessarily like to, but I think they appreciate that conversation. Um, so it helps them to have you know, a better understanding of themselves. And it also helps their providers understand what's going on as well. Um, studies have actually looked at the difference in terms of medical costs over the course of a year or two for those who have been identified as having a cognitive impairment and those who have not. And they actually find that those who are identified earlier overall have a reduced cost of medical care. Fewer visits to the ER, fewer visits to other clinics. Um, especially if they get targeted early, they can kind of put them on the right track so they're not going through so many kind of not useless but maybe unnecessary um, appointments. And so this study was a VA study of 800 veterans, and so the average amount that they actually saved was um, about a little over 1,700 on average per patient, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but I think if you're thinking about every patient in that population, it could add up really quickly. Um, and the last thing on here is that knowledge about diagnosis helps you, you know, have better interventions for improving functioning, um, getting them assistance with IADLs, um, and better management of their other chronic health conditions. You really want to be able to prevent further cognitive decline down the road. Um, so being able to target these individuals sooner may help out in that front as well. Uh, I'm not really sure what we were going to talk about with this part, so I'm going to kind of skim through it. Um, but basically, the Affordable Care Act includes a statement about monitoring um, cognitive functioning at wellness visits, which is kind of what the VA was talking about with some of the cognitive screening um, of people who were over a certain age. Right now, there's no standard, but um, it's something that's probably going to happen down the road. And when asked, you know, they pulled a group of primary care um, patients, and they said, yeah, 81% said, yeah, I would definitely want to participate in this because I would want to know if it's something, you know, that's serious or something that needs to be treated further. Um, so I think it's an important thing to note that, you know, the patients are saying that they would participate, so it's worthwhile on their end as well. And mental health, um, we have a variety of patients that come in, and some of them have cognitive complaints that are maybe secondary to mood um, or other psychiatric conditions. They may be side effects of treatments. Um, sometimes those become the focus of treatment. Sometimes they interfere with treatment. So it's important to really think about this in the mental health setting because so many of our veterans, you know, that may be where they're getting most of their care. So you may be the first people to even notice or hear the complaints that the patients have. Um, and it may be interfering with their participation in your therapies or treatment, medication adherence, and so forth. Um, just to talk a little bit about competence for screening or conducting brief cognitive assessments. For one, you want to have some knowledge in the area so that you know what you're doing is worthwhile, is being done accurately. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll know a little bit more and feel confident in your ability to go forth and screen or briefly assess people's cognition. 
Um, and it's also helpful to know when you should refer. So knowing your limits, knowing you know when it's more beneficial to have them seek care from some other specialty clinic. Um, psychometrics is a big piece of this area of competence. So you want to make sure you're choosing the right norms. So we talk a lot about today about diversity and how different factors such as age and education can impact you know how we interpret results. So you want to make sure that you understand at least on a basic level what the psychometrics are of the measures you're choosing. So that's some of the talk that I'm going to cover today. And what goes along with that is choosing appropriate norms. Um, this we kind of talked about a little bit. So there's some also implications in early diagnosis within the social, social and cultural um, considerations that have to be made. So I, I can't remember which talk it was because some of them kind of overlapped a bit. But there was talk about you know, with certain minorities that their family members are often providing care, there may be a change in social roles that they have, and so for different cultures, having an early diagnosis may have a different kind of impact. So you want to keep that in mind when you're making a diagnosis and referrals, because you want to make sure that you're not, you know, over-stigmatizing or over-pathologizing um, that may lead to some negative consequence or harm. So, you know, we all want to do good. We want to find out early so we can get them the best care, but at the same time, you want to just be aware of these other factors that could come into play. Um, in terms of diagnosis, I've already kind of mentioned this on the previous slide. So you want to choose tests with appropriate norms um, and then appropriate language for administration. So that's one thing that hasn't really come up as much as I thought it would in being a resident here because, you know, within the VA, majority of our patients, they speak English. Many of them, however, don't have English as their primary language. Um, but to my benefit, most of them have, because I'm kind of out of luck, I don't speak another language. But you know, some of you may be in clinics where that's not the case, where you may need to use tests that are in a different language. Um, I know for myself personally, I want to get somebody to do testing with someone who can speak the same language, so that way I know I'm getting valid results. And so the same kind of thought goes into some of these screening measures. You know, if you're in a clinic where a majority of the people, English is not their primary language, you want to make sure and have somebody who's trained in administering a test in Spanish to make sure you're picking up accurate, you know, valid results in that in that patient. Um, and then finally, decision making capacity. Oh, I think it's finally um, decision making capacity. So you know, patients, you have to keep that in mind that that's something you know, as a person's aging with dementia, they may lose the capacity to make decisions. So this may be just one piece of evidence. Um, that would prompt a referral for decision-making capacity. Obviously, there's a lot of other things that go into it, um, but you may want to just, just keep that in mind. That's a, another consideration with this population that, that comes up down the road. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to take a sip of water since the science tell me to drink. And so we're going to talk about a few conditions that are associated with just cognitive complaints or maybe disorders or maybe both. Um, and so the, the main reason why I, I believe these are in here is just so that, you know, we can be aware of other things that can look like um, mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease or, you know, other types of dementia so that we can make sure and make referrals to get these things treated early on if we, if that it, if there is a strong indication that their cognitive complaints may be related to some of these other factors. Um, so medication side effects are one that was mentioned earlier today, so that it could be one of those reversible causes of dementia. Um, psychiatric conditions are often rampant with complaints about memory, which is often you know, related to attention problems or missing information because you know, the PTSD symptoms are very high and they're focusing on their environment, their surroundings, and maybe not noticing what's going on right in front of them. So there, there could be some real psychiatric explanations for some of their memory complaints. Um, a big one in our population involves sleep disturbances, sleep apnea being one of the big ones in my opinion. Um, particularly when they're not treating sleep apnea. So they may complain of, um, you know, memory problems, but it's that their processing speed is really slow, they're not able to pay attention, they're having micro-sleeps throughout the day, falling asleep really easily, so they're missing lots of information. And they're a lot slower at processing it, is what some of the research tells us, in terms of patients who don't treat their sleep apnea. Um, and other sleep conditions can also cause some similar complaints as well. Pain is another big one. Again, that can be something that's really distracting to the patient. It's been associated with problems with attention as well. Um, and then going on to chronic stress and poor stress management. Um, so what you might notice with all of these things is that these things are modifiable. They can be treated. They can be adjusted. 
So you want to just keep these in your kind of on your radar whenever you're talking to patients and they're complaining of memory problems. Just check and see if some of these things might be going untreated or undertreated. This is a table that um, is involved that's included in some of our education materials for patients and staff on mild TBI and some of the um, symptoms of that. And so particularly what I want you to notice is that a lot of the symptoms that are reported in patients that have had mild traumatic brain injury um, are also reported by people who have everyday stress. And it's important to know that because a lot of times, you know, patients will have had a mild TBI maybe two years ago and they're still complaining of the same things. But what we know is that in most cases, having a concussion, which is the same thing as a mild TBI, they will resolve, their problems will resolve within weeks to three months. And so if you're seeing these kind of complaints, they're probably related to something else, um, which is why I like the comparison group of just everyday stress. So everybody experiences these problems some of the time. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. We don't want to over-pathologize or make people blame something on their mild head injury or their concussion whenever it may be depression-related or PTSD-related or a chronic sleep problem. So we want to make sure that they address those things that can't actually be treated. Um, and, and get some real improvements. Uh, some other neurological conditions to look out for. Sometimes um, these are things that, you know, in primary care or mental health settings, you may be the first person the patient sees or the only person they see. So you just want to be aware of some of these complaints that are coming on. So they're having chronic headaches that don't remit or they're having personality changes or all of a sudden waking up and not remembering how to do things they used to be able to do, like tying their shoe or something like that you want to start thinking about maybe there's some sudden neurological change, like a tumor or a stroke, and I think this was discussed earlier in a presentation. Um, so that leads you away from something like Alzheimer's disease and something that would be necessarily, um, that could be you know, something that's more sudden onset that, could, that needs to be addressed more readily, rather than waiting for a longitudinal assessment to see how they do a year from now, is kind of my point. Um, so some risk factors for dementia, I'm just going to scroll through these pretty quickly um, because they are, have already been mentioned today, but age is the biggest one, we, as we all know now. Um, there is a tie with family history, we talked about genetics earlier today, and um, there's, a, oh, sorry, there's a trend for you know, earlier onset to be more um, indicative of possibly a familial um, relationship between, um, or family history of, of dementia being related to that. Um, we talked about, you know, lots about vascular disorders and metabolic disorders. And these are some other ones, such as epilepsy, toxic exposure, um, having a history of delirium. You know, a lot of people don't completely revert back to where they were before at their baseline, so they may have some residual cognitive impairment after going through a stage of delirium, um, which is often brought on by infections and things. So that's kind of not, a, not an exhaustive list, but a pretty long one. And this is just something that I thought, if you have nothing else to kind of keep in mind later, that you know, when you get access to these slides later, um, this is just a list you can refer back to as some common reversible signs that you want to just keep in mind. Um, and I stole this slide from another presentation that somebody had, so I didn't have the reference on here. But um, just keep these in mind because these are things that you can work on in the interim while you're waiting to see if this is something that's neurodegenerative or something that could possibly be improved. So some of the sign, warning signs of dementia, this is a combination of what's been put out by principles and practice in geriatric psychology and then the VHA dementia warning signs. So one is confusion or forgetfulness, so they're having unexplained changes in mental status. They're deferring to the caregiver to answer all the questions. They're not giving their own you know, account of what's been going on day to day, what their cognitive complaints are. It's all their spouse answering everything. Um, that's something that usually I think practitioners, at least the ones that I've worked with, are pretty good about picking up on. Um, they're repeating themselves during the interview, so their recent memory is impaired. They're not really keeping track of what they're doing from moment to moment. Um, getting lost in familiar places. Not taking medications correctly. We get lots of referrals because patients are all of a sudden having a hard time managing their health conditions, and they've been seemingly pretty good about doing that beforehand. Or they're coming to appointments at the wrong day at the wrong time and insisting that they're right, not really realizing that they're you know, a month off on their calendar, things like that. Um, they appear disheveled or not dressed appropriately for the weather, getting out of poor hygiene. Um, this one, it kind of goes along with the medication, so not, not following directions appropriately, not following through on medical changes. So if you change their medications, they all of a sudden can't adapt to that. Maybe in the past they could, and now you have to over-explain or 
draw a picture or a chart to help them understand it, that's a sign that something you know is changing in their brain in terms of how well they're keeping track and adjusting their planning abilities. Um, this is something that patients may not report, but you may notice or their family members may complain of is behavioral changes or agitation. Um, and kind of going along with that, having anxiety, depression, that's come up all of a sudden. Um, I think one of our talks this morning talked about depression may be one of the early or first signs, and I think um, this is definitely something to keep, keep in mind. And then, as also was mentioned earlier, um, there's that tendency to, to lose weight, um, especially whenever they're, you know, right around the time before they get diagnosed. That's, that's a common trend in the literature. And then new neurological complaints. Uh, so now we're getting to the part of the presentation that I was supposed to present on, so hopefully I can do a better job about, of articulating some of these things. So I'll be talking about re cognitive assessments, and I titled this section The Good, the Bad, and the Limitations because they all have their own limitations that are inherent. So I'll try to be fair in terms of talking about why I would, would or would not choose these tests. Um, we're not yet to the stage where we're doing biomarkers, so we have to have something to help us detect these things, so this is kind of where we're at right now in the clinical world. This is just a list of some commonly used cognitive assessment measures. And when I talk about brief cognitive assessments, I'm talking about brief instruments that are used to pick up on cognitive changes or cognitive impairment. And they're testing, you know, ideally, more than one cognitive domain. Because we know, you know, memory is the main area that people complain of, but for some dimensions, that's not the main presentation. So you want to assess more than one domain if you can whenever you're selecting one of these kind of measures. I'm not going to talk about every one of these, but I will talk about um, a few of them. So I think, does everybody in here know what the MMSE is? Has everybody heard of it? Okay, I think as much. Um, it's a really widely used measure, and um, it was originally developed to pick up on cognitive or mental status changes in psychiatric patients. Um, from my understanding of the history of it, it was kind of just decided, these were, this is what we're going to administer, and they just went forth and did. <laughs> There wasn't really a whole lot of research that went into picking, you know, what are the best items, which are going to be most sensitive. Um, they kind of put together a lot of different things that were commonly used within, like, a normal behavioral status exam, basically. Um, it's pretty good about, you know, picking up on dementia, um, or most types of dementia, but there are definitely some limitations in the MMSE. Um, for one, it's less sensitive in detecting some of the subcortical changes, and so, Part of that is because it doesn't really have any measures of executive functioning. There's nothing to do with processing speed. The attention measures are okay on there, but they're kind of easy. They tend to be things that are a little bit more overlearned, I think. Um, so you may miss things like vascular cognitive impairment, um, vascular dementia, mild cognitive impairment. So it's not just something to pick up on some things like that. Um, in individuals who are highly educated or who have a pretty high IQ, you know, before the onset of their problems, they may hit a ceiling and you may not see any problems on the MMSE. They may look completely fine, but be complaining of all kinds of things and have functional impairments, and they, it may not really make sense because they're getting, you know, a 29.5 or 30 on the MMSE. Um, but at the same time, if you look at the other end of the spectrum, they may have real, people who have really low education and we know that that definitely is also related to performance. So they may be over-pathologizing individuals who have lower education. So it's, it's the measure that everybody's used. It's a measure that most other measures have been created or compared against because it's what everybody's familiar with. So in a lot of the studies I'm going to review, they're going to be comparing some of these other measures to the MMSE because this is what everybody had been using prior to that. And some people are still using it. Um, don't get me wrong. I know one area where the VA actually allows people to use it is whenever you're looking at outcomes of medication. Um, but as I'll talk about in a second, because of new copyright issues and its lack of sensitivity, the VA is actually not even recommending it to be used anymore, uh, which is something that I learned only within the last couple of years. Um, and then so my last point on here is that copyright restrictions have limited its use in many healthcare settings. People don't want to pay whenever there's lots of free measures that may be better at detecting dementia or mild cognitive impairment. So this is a list of the recommended mental status measures that the VA has put out. And I put a link on here so if anybody wants to go check out the information they have on their website, um, they can see a little bit more about you know, how they chose these measures. From my understanding is that they chose them based on their brevity and their sensitivity. 
the three to the left are much shorter. And so these are the ones that are probably more ideal in primary care settings, where you only have you know, a very short amount of time to see the patient, or you may have a nurse to go in and administer this while they're waiting to see the physician. Um, they range from three to five minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the mini-cog and GP-cog, because those are the ones that our providers that have been referring to us have been using more frequently. Um, but there's more information on this website if you want to know more about the blessed as well. Um, on the other side of this chart, so the, and I take that back, this one, the STMS, is also one of the briefer ones. Um, the slums and the MOCA are the ones that are a little bit lengthier. And so these are the ones that I often find people that are in mental health settings where they have a little bit more time with patients, maybe 30 minutes to 60 minutes. They're to maybe use these uh, more lengthy ones because they do tap into more different, I'm sorry, more um, cognitive domains in their assessments. So they may get a little bit more information it may be a little bit more specific to the patient's um, specific problems because it does include so many more types of tasks in them. If we look at the age ranges that have been used, so uh, most of them are in, you know, 50s plus, but some of the studies with the MOCA that have come out actually go as far as 20. Now, I haven't seen any, I've seen one study that goes that low, and most of them are also falling within that 50 year and up range, most of the studies. So that, I mean, they're definitely targeting older adult populations, <laughs> and trying to detect things early on, which is why they're you know, getting younger and younger in the studies that are using them. So as I'm reviewing each of these studies, I will be talking about their sensitivity and specificity. And I just wanted to introduce you guys to what that is, in case you don't know, because it'll kind of make it easier to understand the rest of what I'm going to say. Um, I promise I'm not going to get super technical, but I just wanted to at least make sure we're on the same page before I move forward. Uh, so in a broad way, sensitivity refers to true positive. So how good is a test at detecting a problem when there is one? And specificity, which is this blue side here, is how good is the test at picking, or how good is the test at correctly identifying a person as not having a problem, so true negatives. And so with any screening measure, we want to have a good balance between these two because we don't want to overclassify people, but we also don't want to miss people at the same time. So if we're looking here, this is the COIs can consider our condition of interest, and this would be our reference population. So in a screening measure, um, if it has good sensitivity and it rules out the condition, that would be where this orange line is here, we can say with pretty much certainty that the patient probably doesn't have that condition. If we know our measure that we picked is really sensitive at detecting, say, dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and the test results come up negative. So we want to have you know, we want to have a good balance, like I said, and neither sensitivity nor specificity is necessarily more important than the other. So it's really good to pick tests that achieve as well as they can, both of those. Um, the scores range from zero to one, so closer to one means it's better. So we'll keep that in mind as we're reviewing the other results here. So the mini-cog, um, that's one of the three measures that we talked about. It's a three item recall with a clock drawing. Has anybody used this measure before? I think it's pretty common around here. Um, no? Yeah, maybe? So basically the patient that's scored is either normal or abnormal on this measure. They get one point for each word that's recalled and they get um, a point for the clock. And I just put you know, the basic scoring rules for the clock. If all the numbers are in the right place, in the right sequence, and they're pointing to the right, the hands are pointing to the right time, they get a point for that. So the way that you would score that is if they had a three out of three recall, you wouldn't even have to score their clock. The clock still would be done because you do this during the delay. So you administer the list, they draw the clock, and then you ask them to recall the three words. And so if they got all three, you could just say with a, a fair amount of certainty, depending on what you, you know sensitivity and specificity you're comfortable with, you could say, yeah, I think it's pretty normal. I don't think they have dementia. It's not likely. Um, if they got one to two items recalled and their clock was normal, they'd also fall within that group. And then as you can see, if they had an abnormal clock or if they couldn't recall any words, you're considering this to be an abnormal test finding, they likely have dementia, and you may want to refer them on for more testing at that point in time. One thing I want you to keep in mind is that depending on the study, there's a lot of different lists that people have used. So they're all called the mini cog, but they have I don't, I don't even know how many different lists I've seen reviewing the literature. But the one that the VA is recommending, the one that they're referencing, um, includes the words banana, sunrise, and chair, 
I think that's important to know just because there has been some variability in terms of what percent of the list people were called, depending on which three words were given. I mean, you would think it's three words that should make a difference, but apparently it does. Um, I've not personally used this measure, but I think you know it's got a good place in primary care because it is so short and can give you very specific guidance on which direction to go. So when you look at the MINICOG compared to the NMSC, um, I'm not, we're not going to talk about this measure at the bottom, I just copied this paper out of the article um, that I got it from. But the MINICOG, you really have to administer the whole thing, you can't just do a portion of it, because you s significantly drop off in your sensitivity if you're just administering the list or just administering the clock. But as a whole, the MINICOG is pretty similar to the NMSE in terms of sensitivity and specificity. And then they compare it at two different cut points. Um, I guess the benefit of using this over the MMSC is that it's briefer and it's free, and the VA is saying you should use it. Um, you know, if you work, I, I, know, I know not all of you work at the VA, but if you are using the MMSC, they're really um, not happy with that because they don't want to pay because there's a copyright. So just to restate, you know, part of the reason why we would still select the MINICOG over the MMSC. The GPCOG is another brief measure. Um, it has, again, similar properties to the MMSE. Um, the sensitivity and specificity are a little bit higher than the MMSE, and it also um, involves a recall, a wordless recall on a clock. Um, and let me see here. Actually, no, I, I take that back. It's not a wordless recall. It's um, a name and address recall in a clock. So similar kind of verbal information in that they're recalling some piece of verbal information and they're drawing a clock. Um, Whenever they assessed multiple practitioners, um, they had several different measures in that mix, including the MINICOG and MMSC, and this is one of the ones that they said stated that they preferred. Um, the only limitation here is that it's a normative, the normative sample is Australian. I couldn't find any updated norms that were appropriate for our setting, even though the measure itself is pretty comparable to other, other measures that, that the VA is recommending. But it's really limited, as most of these very brief measures are, at detecting dementia. There's no mention of how well they are at detecting mild cognitive impairment or more subtle cognitive deficits. Okay, any questions about those brief ones before I talk about some of the some of the more lengthy ones? Just looking for a break to sip some water. Okay, so has, has anybody used the slums? Yeah. Okay. So this is one that um, came out of St. Louis University. I love the names they pick for these things. It's really colorful. Um, so this test was developed to address some of the limitations of the NMSC. So as I mentioned earlier, one of the limitations is that there's no executive measures in the NMSC, and it's pretty restricted in the types of um, domains it assesses. So this one, for one, accounted for some of those limitations, but also they wanted to also adjust for education. Um, so I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but some some of the NMSC studies do adjust for education if you look at the right normative samples, but not everybody follows those things. But the slums doesn't really give you an opportunity to ignore it because they put it right there at the bottom of their sheet. So you're going to see that they want you to adjust for education. So for individuals who've had high school education or higher, there's ranges for whether you're picking up on normal, mild cognitive impairment or dementia, or um, mild neurocognitive disorder, and then Less than high school education, you can see they have a different range. So slightly lower expectations in terms of you know, where you're going to see them perform so that you're not over-pathologizing based on something that is confounded by education. Um, and they say the mean administration time is seven minutes. It usually takes me longer, but I'm a bit of a talker, so I don't know if that's just my fault or what. But it does take you know, roughly around seven minutes to administer. Um, and then, you know, this also addresses that issue of the NMSC and some of these other brief measures only being sensitive to picking up on dementia. This is one of the ones that is specifically looking at kind of the intermediate stage of more subtle cognitive difficulties. So in the normative sample, it was actually a veteran sample. They compared the NMSC in the slums. Um, the sample is pretty similar to, I guess, most of our patients that we see here. Um, there are clinics that are 60 years and older. Um, high school or more is in about 67%, although in the VA sometimes we see patients with lower education. I think for the majority that's about right. Um, in other sample, 62.4% had normal cognitive, cognitive functioning. Um, and unfortunately, the study provided no information on race or ethnicity, so I can't really tell you if it's well represented by you know, our population here, but um, you know, 
it's St. Louis, so it is a diverse population in general, but it tends to be more Caucasian African American, so there may be less of a Hispanic population or Asian American population, so I'm just making assumptions based on the region in which the data were collected, that there may be some limitations there. Um, and so what they also did is they used DSM criteria, they collected labs and other, other measures during their study. If you want to know more about that, you can you know, look up the original study to find out more about the data. Um, so when they looked at the cutoffs, they looked at two different cutoffs for each um, group. So I already mentioned they have a less than, less than high school education group, and they have a high school or greater. And so when we're looking at the cutoffs um, for NCI, we're seeing that those who have less than high school, um, the cutoff they recommend is 23.5. And so the sensitivity and specificity are pretty good. They're getting close to one. That's what we really want to see, especially this, you know, over 0.9 is really good. Um, the MMSC in their study, so they looked at just within their patient population, a score of 28.5 is what was most sensitive to pick up on mild cognitive impairment in their sample. But notice the sensitivity and specificity is pretty low. So it's just, it is above chance, but you know, not really ideal for what we've, we've aspired to. If we're looking at dementia, it's a much better um, in terms of the MMSC, because they're around 80, 81 and 87. But the Sloan still has a beat because they have, you know, perfect sensitivity and 0.98 specificity in the sample with a cutoff of 19.5. Um, similar things are seen, you know, with um, high school or greater. So at a cutoff of 25 and a half, they're, you know, pretty sensitive, losing a little bit in specificity, which isn't entirely surprising since education is probably playing a role there. Um, but with the MMSC, you're getting, you know, 0.75 for sensitivity and below chance for specificity. So what that tells you is you're probably missing a lot of people um, who very well may have the disease, or you may be um, over pathologizing, depending on which of these scores you're looking at. Okay, so within the dementia group, we see similarly that the slums is really good about picking up on dementia. MMSC good, but not quite as good, but you know, still that's what the MMSC is best at, is picking up on dementia. So it's not surprising that they would have trouble picking up on mild cognitive impairment when they're comparing it to the MMSC. Okay, so we're going to see a similar story with the MOCA, but I'm going to go into it a little bit more because it's one that's been used quite a bit in our clinics around here, and one where they've come up with some new normative data, some good, some not so good. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And I apologize, I have a typo. It's supposed to say 30 point test. It's actually got fewer items in that, but they get scored differently. Um, so you can find out more information about the MOCA at mochatest.org. They have um, lots of different forms, so different versions of it. If you're doing longitudinal assessments, you can switch it up and use a different form. They're pretty um, reliable in test retest reliability. They have different um, languages, different countries that have been normed within. Uh, for the MOCA, so they have lots of different versions if you're doing research outside of here or if you're working with patients in other, in other countries, they probably have a MOCA for you. Um, they also emphasize executive functioning more than MMSC did, and they also have demonstrated in some of their studies the pretty good reliability and validity. Um, and just like all the others, education is correlated with performance. So to adjust for that, what they've done is on the original MOCA, they have a one-point adjustment. So for anybody who's got um, less than 12 years, of 12 years of education or less, they are actually adding a point to their score. And that's their way of answering for that education finding. So they're kind of making an adjustment so that you're not over, over pathologizing those with lower education. This is the original um, normative sample data. So you see the sample sizes aren't huge. They're in the 90s. Um, the average score varied as you would expect from normal controls to Alzheimer's disease. Um, there was a little bit of overlap between MCI and dementia, so what they ended up doing is they ended up going with the same cut score, so less than 26, regardless of whether you're thinking it's MCI or dementia, but you're using that functional piece that um, um, we talked about earlier today. That's really what kind of they conceptualize as being the changing thing, the big difference between MCI and Alzheimer's disease is they're having some functional impairment. So they're saying, yes, less than 26, but if there's a functional impairment, you better start thinking Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So if we look at their sample, um, comparing it to the MMSE, so here we have the three different groups of white is normal control, the middle color is MCI, the other color is um, Alzheimer's disease, and this line here represents their cutoff. 
So we can see that MCI for the MMSC stays above that cutoff, um, you know, for both normal controls and MCI patients, that the Alzheimer's disease, you know, does go below, and that's kind of consistent with what we've been talking about so far. Um, but you see more variability in test performance with, um, within the MOCA, and that's really important if you're going to be tracking treatment change, intervention responses, change over time. You want a test that's going to be more sensitive, have a little bit more variability in it in terms of um, distinguishing between those intermediate stages of cognitive impairment. And that's kind of what's reflected down here in the chart where we're looking at sensitivity and specificity. So if we're looking at the MMSE with MCI, we see that it's very specific. So it says everybody doesn't have the disorder. So that's what that 1.0 is telling you. And it's really, really poor at picking up on MCI in this Montreal sample. Um, and it's, it's better at picking up on dementia. And then we can see with the MOCA, they're good on both fronts. Um, with Luis et al., they cross-validated the MOCA. And so basically, they, they reapplied this in a U.S. sample. And they found that the cutoff that the original MOCA study was suggesting was a little too high for a U.S. population. Over 66% of their, or about 66% of their patients actually met criteria below that 26. They met criteria for some type of cognitive problem. And so they felt like they needed to revamp this and cross-validate it to determine that that's the best cutoff. And so what they found in their sample is that a 23 or below is actually more appropriate for the U.S. sample they assessed. And this was done out of Florida, so they did have um, they didn't report all of the demographics on their on their ethnic groups as well, uh, but they did have a similar age range, similar education level as the original study. Um, Rosetti et al. is another new normative study that came out, and this is part of the Dallas Heart Study. Now, their sample was much younger than the original MOCA study, but they had um, more diverse samples than the previous studies that had been published. Um, and the main thing here is that they also found that their patients scored much lower on the MOCA than what you would expect using the original Montreal norms. So they decided to publish their own norms, and they are the, I think they have the biggest sample size out of any of the studies that have come out. Um, but the biggest limitation with this study is that they didn't have as, as rigorous or strict criteria for excluding patients because it was a population-based study. Um, so there may be some people that have cognitive problems that got included in the normative study. So we know that when people develop test norms, they want to get people who are free of disease you know, that would be impacting their cognition, and that may not be the case in this sample. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. They did exclude anybody who had cognitive complaints, however, but we know that you know, some people lack awareness, so that's what I mean when I say some people may have ended up in the study that had cognitive problems. Um, this is, I'm not going to go over this in great detail, but this is just for future reference if you, you know, get a copy of the slides. Um, I'd be happy to share with anybody who wants them. Um, but this is the table that came out in Rosetti et al.'s study. And so basically you have it stratified by age and education, so you can look up where your patient falls and see how close they are to the mean for their age. Uh, most of them are falling right around that 20, 22, 23 range. Um, for me to be more on the conservative side, I'm liking some of the other studies that excluded people with cognitive impairment, just to make sure we're not missing people. But this is another source of data you can use to determine how to interpret the MOCA. Um, and then finally, there's some several validation studies that came out of this group in Portugal, and they found similar results to some of these other U.S. studies, that the MOCA original cutoff is too high, and that something around 22 was more appropriate for their population as well. So, you know, the evidence is mounting that maybe in some other countries you want to look and see what's most appropriate for your population. Um, and so they they validated it in MCI, Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, they looked at all these populations and found a pretty similar cutoff across all the different studies of 22 um, to detect NCI without any functional complaints. And then, you know, if they still don't have functional complaints and they're below a 17, it may be due to lack of awareness or just underreporting, and they're saying that that's more consistent with Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia. Um, this is just kind of stating all the different studies that has looked at the MOCA versus the MSE. So just to summarize, the MMSC and MINICOG and other very brief cognitive measures are pretty good at detecting dementia, but if we're picking, uh, trying to pick up on more subtle cognitive impairment or MCI, they may not be the best measures. So you want to think about, okay, well, what else can we administer that have more utility, um, can cast a wider net? And so the slums is one that's been identified by the VA and in the literature, although there's not as much research on this measure, which is why I didn't talk about it as much, uh, compared to the MOCA. 
NAMOCA, you know, so far has been good at tracking change over time. They've gotten some new norms that make it a little bit easier to interpret in our U.S. population, and it's been cross-validated in multiple populations. All the studies are, are limited, so there's no one measure that's better for everything. Um, a brief cognitive assessment does not completely eliminate or replace the need for a more formal evaluation. Um, you may still want to get labs and imaging done. You may want to send them for neurosite testing. Um, you don't really want to diagnose just based on this one piece of information. You may want to do a more thorough clinical interview before determining you know, what diagnosis you're going with, for instance. Um, and just keep in mind that whatever test you choose is going to have its limitations and benefits. So just you know, don't be afraid to try a new test. Um, until you, you know, until you try them out, you won't really know how you like it or how it compares in your patient population. Some people start off by doing more than one just so they kind of know how to compare it to what they've been doing all along, and that's okay too. Um, but usually time and cost are the big, the big issues to keep in mind as well, um, in addition to what we've already talked about, about choosing sensitive measures. And this is just a slide that summarizes everything in terms of the cut scores. So I've already mentioned all of it, so I'm not going to go into it, but you can refer back to this later one, one slide to kind of see where all the different measures lie that I covered today. There's plenty more measures, though. Um, so I think if I'm not out of time, I wanted to cover a couple case examples, actually three, but one's a little bit longer than the other. Um, this is a case that I saw about a year ago, um, funny enough, about yeah, almost exactly a year ago. This was a 75-year-old white male, 12 years of education. He was referred by neurology for evaluation of memory loss. Um, so he was suspected of having normal pressure hydrocephalus or Parkinson's disease. They were in the process of uh, making a differential diagnosis and wanted some other input. Um, the reasons why they were thinking it was NPH is because he had a recent fall and he had a couple episodes of urinary incontinence. And the consult said that there were some memory difficulties, at least that were observed by the, um, the neurologist that had seen him. When I saw the patient, um, of course you don't ever get the same story. Um, he noted occasional confusion while driving, but attributed this to vision problems. Um, he noted some minor word-finding problems. He and his wife both denied any problems with memory. They denied any functional problems. Um, but after talking to them for about five minutes about, you know, what is it that he's doing at home, he's not really doing a whole lot of anything. Um, and his wife's actually doing pretty much everything. So she's giving him frequent reminders. Just during our interview, she must have prompted him with reminders about 20 to 30 times. So I don't even think she's aware of the fact that she prompts him constantly. So yes, he's doing it, but he's requiring lots and lots and lots of prompts. Um, no significant psychiatric history in this gentleman. So we did the NMSE with him. Um, and the main reason I did this is because neurology wanted to do a lumbar puncture, and they usually do the NMSE, and I was trying to convince him that the MOCA might be a little bit more sensitive, because he did, um, he didn't have a ton of, you know, psychosocial kind of things that would make me think that, um, you know, it was psychiatric in nature, and I just know how limited the MMSE can be in some of our patients with more subtle problems. So in the MMSE, he was fully oriented. He could repeat all the words. He lost one point for serial sevens, could recall all the words after a delay, could name a pen and a watch, could follow three steps, could read and follow directions on the paper. He wrote a sentence. He spelled one word incorrectly, but you know, you don't get counted off for that here. And he could copy the pentagons perfectly fine. So he ended up with an MMSC score of 29 out of 30. And so that was based on his, his losing one point for serial seven. Here's his pentagon, so it looks pretty much like we would want it to look if it was within a normal range, I guess. It's a little out of shape, but it's still there, still meets the criteria. Um, then I administered the MOCA to him the next day. So I didn't do them back to back. I didn't want to have any interference with the word list. Um, so the MOCA has a little bit, uh, has. A, more information about orientation is the very last thing you ask him. So he was still full, fully oriented as he was the day before. This time he did a five word list um, repetition. He could repeat all five words just fine. Um, the next day he made multiple errors on serial sevens, but he ended up getting four out of six points um, overall. His visual spatial, I'll show you his picture, his stuff in a second, but it was a little variable there. He, so he got four out of five points. He could still name just fine, but he had difficulty repeating a longer sentence. So he could follow the short sentence on the MMSE, but when you ask him to repeat a long sentence, he kind of lost it halfway through. Um, and he had difficulty with abstraction, so you know, how are an apple and a banana alike? He had a hard time making those connections. Um, and he couldn't recall any words from the list at all. Um, the MOCA has this optional piece where you can give them a category clue and see if that can like trigger some memories. You can kind of 
qualitatively look at recognition memory, and that didn't really help. He got one with a semantic cue, saying, okay, one of them was a color, but was it? He couldn't really pull that out. So he got a 21 out of 30 on the MOCA. So you see a much wider range of problems when we're looking at this measure for him. Um, so what he had trouble with on the visual spatial stuff was, was his clock drawing. And remember, a lot of people administered the MMSC plus a clock for that reason, because it's kind of missing some of that executive piece. So he had some trouble here. Primarily, um, his numbers weren't necessarily spaced too well, but the main thing he lost points for was that he only had one hand, and it wasn't pointing to any of the correct times anyway. Uh, but he could roughly copy the geometric design, and he could do a little mini trails. So when we look at his two scores, if we're talking about the cutoffs for the, for the MOCA, some people recommend a cutoff of 20, below 29 to detect mild cognitive impairment with the MMSC. And so he really doesn't need either one of those cutoffs. So this would warrant no further testing. Um, you know, if you're thinking of it kind of rigidly, not knowing what the neurologist is observing in, the, in interaction with him. But with the MOCA, regardless of which cutoff that I mentioned earlier, he meets cutoff criteria for all of those. So they definitely, you know, did a good thing by sending him on to us because he was having more functional problems at home that you know weren't being addressed. Um, so this is just a summary of the neuropsych data that I administered, the test I administered with him. And this line here represents um, a T-score of 35. So a T-score is like a standardized measure where you take all of their test scores and you put them on the same metric. So you can directly compare performance. And a T-score has a mean of 50 and a standard deviation of 10. So if they're falling you know, below 40, that's below a standard deviation. If they're falling below 35, that's one and a half standard deviations below. So that's where I put my mark here, um, just to kind of represent kind of how far down he's performing. So if you look at what he did well on, let me see here. So he, he did okay on list recognition, so he could recognize some information. Um, that's this line here, the 40. This one here is his name or his naming abilities on the R band, and his naming abilities on another test. So his language is pretty good. So if you think about it, I mean, if you have attention, that's okay, and you can speak pretty okay, you can get pretty far on some of the cognitive screeners that we have. But if you look a little deeper, he's got trouble with, you know, list learning, he's got trouble with visual spatial skills, he's got trouble, a lot of trouble um, with processing speed and attention measures. So he definitely has some impairments across the board. And things that are coming up most significant for him are things like visual memory, which isn't really assessed by any of our cognitive screeners. And processing speed and attention, which is really a, like a subcortical vascular kind of presentation. People who have more problems in that area tend to be more poorly in that area. So I think it just I think it's a good illustration of how some tests, if you're not choosing the test that's most sensitive, you might be missing a whole lot of stuff that may be going on underneath that you wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, so I just think it was an interesting case. I thought I got to work on it. I thought I was following neurology around for that month. Um, one, another case I'm going to present really briefly, because this these don't really require a whole lot of explanation. I had two patients that I saw for um, a dementia group that I was um, working with, and we were looking at outcomes just to see if it's helpful at all. So this was just one piece of what we were doing. We were mostly interested in looking at quality of life and mood over time, but I thought just to look and see how well the MOCA can be used more longitudinally, this would be over the course of a few months. Um, I looked at just pre-treatment and post-treatment scores, so it just looks at, you know, how over the course of, I think it was about 10 weeks for this patient, um, he had a diagnosis of vascular dementia, and uh, at, before the treatment, he was at a total score of 21. After the treatment, 19. It wasn't a treatment that was expected to improve cognition, so it just kind of showed me that, yeah, he was still pretty stable, still within a similar range of performance. This is how we did on some of the designs, so he looks pretty similar overall which is what you would expect in somebody with vascular dementia who hasn't had any further cerebrovascular accidents or other insults to the brain. Um, in terms of this last um, case study, this was a man that was diagnosed with mixed dementia, so Alzheimer's disease with a vascular component. He was also going through my treatment group, and also around the, uh, the same week that we did our pre-treatment assessment, he got prescribed an epizil, so he was also um, you know, just recently going through medication treatment for um, you know, trying to improve his functioning as much as possible and possibly prevent progression. Um, so he had an initial score of nine, which is pretty low. He was pretty um, advanced in his stage, actually. He had a lot of trouble with a lot of different tasks, uh, memory, visual, spatial, language being the big ones. 
Um, and post-treatment, he had a score of 14, so he had a little, a little bit better, but again, um, probably not statistically significant. It definitely wasn't changing tons of functional, um, you know, day-to-day -day functioning, but I think it was still, again, a good estimate of looking at how he hadn't progressed over the course of, you know, two and a half months. Um, and I thought it was interesting that he actually got a little bit more organized with his clock by the end of it. I don't know if that was just chance or what, but... <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, overall it's pretty similar. So you, just to demonstrate that, you know, you can use the MOCA, it's pretty reliable. Um, this is a really brief time of pre and post testing, but over a year you may be able to pick up on more subtle declines if it is a patient who is, you know, progressing um, into a more significant stage. Oops, I went backwards instead of forwards. So the last thing is just, a lot of people don't know how or when they need to refer elsewhere, and I only can speak to my service and when I hope that people refer to me. And so for one is if you have any concerns or indication of cognitive problems, so if they're complaining of things, if you're noticing things, if you do one of these screening measures and you notice something, you know, any of those reasons might be a good enough reason um, to ask. Uh, so sometimes it's this patient or the spouse complaining. Um, and then what's often helpful to include in referrals to neuropsychology is what are the complaints? So how long have they been going on? How severe are they? Is this a change from before? Are they occurring every day? Um, do they improve whenever you know, they're getting better sleep or when their mood's better? Because sometimes those, those are signs that it may be related to other things that might be more treatable than the interim while you're waiting on this to answer a consult. Um, but you, know, you want to be able to kind of keep those things in mind when you're asking questions. Um, is there a neurological problem? So have they had a stroke or a seizure or a TBI or something that you can you know, definitely tie the cognitive change to? Um, and again, this just kind of restates an associated event is one that occurred right before the onset of the symptoms. And then finally, is there any day-to-day -day functional impairment? So with MCI, we don't really expect to have functional impairment. Um, they may be using more compensatory strategies or taking a little bit longer. But when we're talking about you know, somebody who has Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia, we expect you know, that there may be some functional complaints that the patient has or that their spouse has taken over. And so it'd be good to know some of that information. We definitely ask the same questions, but it's good to know just whenever we're trying to figure out if it's an appropriate referral or not. Um, these are some selected references that I can, um, again, if you guys are interested in the slides, will be included in that. So, any questions? I feel like I talked a long time. Yes? Um, uh, I might have missed it, but for the first case example, what was the diagnosis? He had vascular dementia. He had a stroke about, um, I think about 18 months before I'd seen him. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anybody scared to use any of those new measures, or anybody looking forward to using them? Well, it's more like a general problem uh -huh. in terms of the, I mean, here at the VA, you have it all. I mean, yeah. you screen for, with this is screens that are pretty really reliable as you put it together, then you go ahead and basically do what you do, like you did. I mean, you follow the appropriate channels, and then you're pretty confident this patient most likely have the dementia. Mm -hmm. um, but then the truth is that in you know, the other settings, you know, it's very difficult for patients to say you're going to need a neuropsychological testing. Yes. You know, yeah, we're kind of in a unique situation. Thousand dollar. Yeah. Test or we're in a unique like situation because you, the yeah. VA has no psychologist. That's not necessarily always possible in the community, and that's where it's so good to ask those functional questions and get a good history on the patient because that may be enough to guide you in in the right direction, and that's where longitudinal assessment can be helpful as well. Sometimes we even don't know after one time, you know, we, we'll say, you know, we think this is it, but it's hard to say if it's neurodegenerative after seeing them one day, so we have to really, you know, especially if the patient's a poor historian and you have no medical records, I mean, that's what happens out in the community, that you, you have no records and no information, and a patient can't give you a lot of information. So it definitely makes it more challenging when you don't have tons of information like we kind of take for granted in the VA, definitely. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your time. I, ex I uh, um, took the whole time anyway, so I'm glad I started early. <laughs> I think it's because I rambled the first half, but yeah, thank you. Excellent job, thank you. One more time for Dr. Marco. She, you know, she uh, substituted uh, for both speakers, so thank you very much. <laughs> No problem. We're doing that. Okay, uh, we got one more speaker left. We're taking a break. Uh, we're going to take a small break. Sweet break.